Good morning, and welcome to worship with First Presbyterian Church. It's online worship. I'm in the Weddington Courtyard, which has been uh, repurposed. We're not going to worship here. We'll be in the sanctuary. But there's a relationship here between this pile of rocks, which in the biblical tradition is called an Ebenezer, and window number three, the dream of Jacob at Bethel, which we will be considering in the scripture this morning. If you would like to be centered for worship, there is a spirituality exercise. If you click the link below, uh, you also can save that for later. For now, Jacob, when he woke up after a dream at Bethel, built an Ebenezer, a monument of rocks to indicate that God had been encountered in that place. It is a rich tradition, and this Ebenezer is in this courtyard uh, to symbolize how God's people who pass through and serve with First Presbyterian Church have encountered God in this place. God's promise to be with us and to go with us. Friends, again this morning, we are worshiping God. <laughs> Jesus, our Lord. Would you join me in singing hymn number 475, Come, Thou Fount of Every Blessing. Let us pray. 
When you have encountered us, O God, frequently we consider the encounter as a personal blessing, somehow to our credit, rather than the encounter being your undeserved claim upon us for serving you near and far. Hear us now as we come before you in a time of confession through silence. We are divided, O Holy One, from those who are family, those who are friends, those who are associates, those we hardly know, and those we know not at all. Forgive us the sin of alienation and of how our divisions keep us from respectful reconciliation. O giver of mercy, of this there is no doubt. We have failed you, failed ourselves, and failed others. Journey with us from your love, for the sharing of life in your love, so that day by day, we faithfully serve you among all of your people in the way and spirit of Jesus Christ. Amen. Friends, let us hear and share with gladness the good, blessed news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven and made whole. Thanks be to God. Let us now hear the word of God from Genesis 28, verse 5 and 6, and then verses 10 through 19. Now Isaac sent Jacob away, and Jacob went to Padan Aram, to Laban, son of Bethuel, the Armenian, the brother of Rebekah, Jacob's and Esau's mother. Now Esau saw that Isaac had blessed Jacob and sent him away to Padan Aram to take a wife from there. Jacob left Beersheba and went toward Haran. He came to a certain place and stayed there for the night because the sun had set. Now taking one of the stones of the place, he put it under his head and he lay down in that place and slept. And he dreamed that there was a ladder set up on the earth, the top of it reaching to heaven. And the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And the Lord stood behind him and said, I am the Lord, the God of Abram, your father, and the God of Isaac. The land upon which you lie, I will give you and also to your offspring. And your offspring shall be like the dust of the earth, and you shall spread abroad to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south. And all the families upon the earth will be blessed in you and also your offspring. Know that I am with you and will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land. For I will not leave you until I have done that which I have promised you. Then Jacob woke from his sleep and he said, Surely the Lord God is in this place, and I did not even know it. And he was afraid, and he said, How awesome is this place! There is none other than the house of God, and this is a gate of heaven. So Jacob rose early in the morning. He took the stone that he had put under his head and set it up for a pillar and poured oil on top of it. He called that place Bethel. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
the First Presbyterian Church sanctuary displays 11 18-foot tall windows, each of six stacked sections of artistically arranged faceted glass. These illustrate covenant themes in the Bible, and they are a 1966 creation of the Smith Glass Studio in Fort Worth. For 11 Sundays, and we've said this the previous two weeks, we are exploring their biblical themes one at a time. Today, we are considering the third window, that of Jacob's dream at Bethel. 13 centuries before Jesus, Jacob's family included his father, his mother, his twin brother Esau, and himself. Simply described, Jacob, who was the younger of these two twins, Jacob and mother Rebekah were competing against father Isaac and the firstborn twin Esau, so that Jacob could equal or surpass his brother in his inheritance. One brother and one person, uh, a, a parent, uh, competing to gain the upper hand against the other brother and the other parent. It is an old story, conflict in families. And the conflict is often about money, land, possessions, favor, beliefs, etc. Once Jacob's mother tricks his father, who is mostly blind in his older age, once Jacob's mother tricks his father into blessing Jacob as a primary heir, Jacob's mother thinks it best for Jacob to leave and live for a few years on her brother's ranch many miles away. So Jacob leaves home in a hurry before slightly older brother Esau can locate him around the house. Mr. Smith's third faceted glass window from 1966 illustrates the night on the trail where Jacob was headed toward his uncle's ranch many miles away. And, and when somewhat worried Jacob lay his head upon a rock pillow and slept and dreamed. The dream included a ladder or staircase or uh, in 20th or 21st century terms we might say even an escalator between God's heaven and earth below. And angels uh, who are messengers, they convey the wisdom and will from God as needed and as commissioned. So the word from God eternal which Jacob receives during his night of nervous sleep with his head on a rock or two for a pillow, this is all a message of promise. Yes, you've been deceptive, Jacob. Yes, you are running from your brother's clear anger at how you have set yourself up to receive a large portion of the family inheritance. True, your life is not perfect in ethics and honesty. Yet I bless you as a conveyor of my blessing, says the word in the dream. I'm going with you now. I'm coming back with you later. Life for the future is built upon life today. I am part of life with you today. I'll be part of life with you and others in the future. Jacob, live into this promise. Now before we go back to Jacob's waking up the next morning, let's come forward 3,200 years or so. Rather than directly uh, diving into conflicts which might be present in your family or my family or in First Presbyterian Church, Bryan, or in Brazos County or in the United States, there, there are conflicts everywhere. Let's first overhear a conversation from 83 years ago 
in a backyard about three hours south of here. As you overhear this conversation, try to listen less to the particular labels that are employed and more to the personalities and the general way they describe uh, the characters, how they describe each other and their differences. A 1932 graduate of Wharton High School, aspiring to act and write for the theater. Uh, over the next five years, he went to Dallas, and then he went to Los Angeles, and then to New York, before returning home for a visit with his parents during the summer of 1937. Here's what he tells. The first night I was home, we sat under the chinaberry trees in the backyard. My parents questioned me about my acting classes and teachers, my friends and the jobs where I had been working, attempting to have my income match my bills. Um, and then I offered some criticism of the South's large agricultural endeavors and economic interdependency on poor white and black laborers. My father then asked, I hope you're still a Democrat, son. Yes, I'm still a Democrat, I replied. And my dad said, I tell you, son, I could forgive you almost anything except your voting Republican. And my mother added, you know, we're having a terrible time. Half of our family is not speaking. It's just terrible. Why is that? I asked. And my dad chimed in, because they're ungrateful. Half of my relatives, God help me, are Roosevelt haters. I just don't get it after all he's done for the South. Who hates FDR? I asked. Your cousin Thomas, who lives here in Wharton. He's a Dixiecrat. Have you heard how they want to take over the Democratic Party in the South? Racists they are. And my sister and her husband, my dad said, drove all the way here from Houston about 10 days ago. He did it so he could sit in my living room and tell me he voted Republican. I said, sister, did you vote Republican too? And she said, I did. Just smug, I tell you. Can you imagine how in the name of God? And then my mother chimed in. Now, honey, don't get all worked up. Before this visit in Wharton ended, though, Cousin Thomas, the Dixiecrat, his mother called and invited the entire family over for dinner at her house. My mother accepted, but only under the condition that she could squeeze a promise out of me and my father not to talk politics. Apparently, Dixiecrat Cousin Thomas's mother made him promise the same because politics never came up at our extended family's dinner together. That 21-year-old from Horton, Texas would live 72 more years along the way of his journey receiving two Academy Awards and a Pulitzer Prize for his writing. Such recognition was possible, we might say, given his sensitivity to the way ordinary people are and to the way ordinary people become who they become, you know, how they grow into an identity in their varied life journeys. In Jacob's household, 3,300 years ago, twin sons were in competition for an inheritance of land, livestock, money, and yes, pride. And this built walls between them. In Wharton, Texas in 1937, an extended family was competing for the upper hand in politics and ideological influence. The difference among which created walls between them. Friends, whether traveling by walking or riding, whether working or sleeping, 
whether uh, under a roof and ceiling or under the canopy of the wide sky above, Jacob's dream in the night and the Ebenezer, um, the rock marker that he builds to commemorate that location. Uh, that's also illustrated in the window beside his head. So the next morning he builds this Ebenezer. The Ebenezer is what reminded folks long ago uh, that we, all of us, belong to God who journeys with us in order to accompany and to change, in order to transform and to make new, however long that takes. And this accompanying, as it happens, includes God's undeserved, unearnable love and grace which bless Jacob and bless his brother Esau and you and me and others in the different roles we have which comprise our lives. The roadmap of each other's journey is written in our memories and on our souls. We are engaged along each one's journey, all of us are, by conflicted feelings, conflict, conflicted relationships, conflicted consciences, and conflicted orientations. In his 2019 book, Sailing True North, Ten Admirals and the Voyage of Character, Admiral retired James Stravitas explores the life journeys and gifts, gifts for leadership of 10 different admirals of different time periods and nations. Admiral Stravitas concludes his book with these words. This constant process of self-examination is at the heart of improving our character which is indeed the work of a lifetime for us all. None of us is perfect, but some are farther along in the voyage of knowing themselves fearlessly and honestly and working hard to improve. That is the voyage upon which I hope you are well and truly embarked, and I wish you Godspeed all the days of your life. Godspeed. It's a word from about 250 years ago with roots in Middle English. It means, may God prosper you. Not meaning, may God make you rich monetarily. Not meaning, may God grant you to have the upper hand. But rather, may God be with you along your journey among all conflicts, learnings, and transformations. May God guide you and shape you from love, for love, serving among God's people day by day, near at hand or at a far distance. Godspeed. May God prosper you from love, for love, in serving among God's people. All honor and praise be to God. Lord, listen to your children pray. Lord, listen to your children Let us begin this time of prayer as a prayer for silence, both for ourselves and for others. Amen. 
Amen. Now let us share in prayers first offered in the summer of 1942 by United States President Franklin Roosevelt. Let us pray. O oh God, this earth is but a small planet in a great universe. Yet, if we but choose, it can be a planet unvexed by war, untroubled by hunger or fear, undivided by senseless distinctions of race, color, or theory. Grant us courage and foreseeing to begin this task today, so that our children and all who follow us may be proud of the human race in every place and future. Your spirit in us has awakened. Your spirit in us has gone forth. There is so much for which we should be grateful, yet we also pray your continuing aid and help for one and all, self, family, friends, colleagues, strangers, that from your care and steadfastness, wholeness and love would rise up within each one. Grant us the wisdom and the vision to comprehend the greatness of the human spirit that often suffers immensely and endures courageously for a sacred goal beyond each person's own brief span. We are, all of us, children of earth. Grant us the simple knowledge that if our brothers and sisters are oppressed, then we are oppressed. If they hunger, we hunger. If their freedom is taken away, our freedom is not secure. Grant us a common faith that human beings, your people, shall know sustenance and peace, justice and righteousness, freedom and security, plus both an equal opportunity and an equal chance to do one's best, not only in our own lands, but throughout the world. In this faith, let us march, march toward the world, which you bless and call us to share in building. Hear us also as we pray the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. To join us in singing hymn number 315 in the midst of new dimensions.
friends, as you go out into the world, do so with eyes wide open, that we may always seek God in the other, and celebrate the diversity that not all is the same, yet we are all children of God. And may we do so in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.